Welcome. Very nice to be here. Uh, you know, when I first met you, I asked you, uh, what's the key to being able to retain cognitive health as I aged? Was it state of mind? And you laughed and you said, yes, it is. But it's that and a whole lot more, isn't it? Yeah, it really is that and a whole lot more. Um, you know, obviously the biggest, the biggest risk factor for your cognition is age. You know, if you just uh, measure, oh, really all kinds of parameters of cognitive function, whether it's, uh, you know, ability to plan ahead, reaction time, you name it, it just steadily goes down uh, as you get older. So I guess one of the ways you could uh, retain good cognitive function until you uh, die is to die young. That would be one strategy you could adopt. I don't want that one. You don't want that. You want no, another I, one, I, do yeah, you? Yeah, I want another one. Yeah. What's option B? <laughs> What's plan B, you say? Well, the other thing you could consider doing is choosing a very good set of parents. Have you thought about that? I, I missed out on that one. You missed out on that one also. So that's plan B. Bad at work. Okay, why don't we go on to plan C, Stu? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, obviously genetics is an important uh, contributor and people are learning more and more about the genetics of intelligence and about the genetics of risks for uh, you know, de degenerative diseases that mm -hmm. hit you like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and things like strokes that will erode your cognitive capabilities as you get older. But I would say actually that there's more and more evidence that um, you know, actually simple lifestyle choices can make a pretty big difference in how well you're going to age. Like what? Well, so one, you know, one thing you might not expect to be important, but turns out actually to be pretty important, is sleep. So many people, as they get older, their sleep gets worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And on average, apparently, we have lost as a society in North America about one hour of sleep uh, per night in the last 40 years. We're just much more busy. It's a much more stressogenic society that we're in. And that shows up in your sleep. Now, why is sleep important? Mm -hmm. Well, um, part of it is what we're learning about how, for instance, memory works. So. Um, there's, we're, re we're really now able to look into the brain using sophisticated scanning technologies that we have and we can actually watch your memory uh, in action. We can see your memories being formed now. It's crazy. Things that were just impossible 10 years ago. Uh, we can now see, um, you know, using, uh, you know, basically uh, MRI technology and other kinds of, uh, of techniques. So. Well, you can literally see the input of information through the prefrontal cortex into the hippocampus. Into the, into the hippocampus. Then, you know, we can watch the hippocampus. So, like, uh, some of these things you can only see in an animal where you actually have to implant electrodes, but mm -hmm. you, can, you can basically see it in animals well, and you can see some parts of it in humans. Um, so, uh, I'll just tell you about an experiment that was done um, uh, by a, a fellow named Matt Wilson, who was working in a, a, a lab. He's now a professor at MIT. Um, he was studying uh, rats running through mazes. And what he could do is by now you can record from the hippocampus and you can see in, in this part of the brain, you can, you can tell by listening to, he could listen to a couple hundred neurons at once. Uh, he could play them on a loudspeaker and hear them. Uh, you can tell where the rat is in the maze. Now the rat's at the beginning, now he's at the first choice point, now he's there, and now he's finally got the food. You can see all that. So he does the experiment and he's watching the rat and the hippocampus is all part of the map and it's also part of your memory system. And then the experiment's over and um, takes the rat out of the maze and he just puts him in a little uh, waiting room and he starts to write up his lab notes. And he's still listening to all these neurons there, just, he just hasn't unhooked the rat. Um, as he's writing his notes, he hears the rat running through the maze. In his brain. On the loudspeakers. Yeah, but it's the, the rat is running through the maze in, in his, his brain. brain. In his brain. You, now he's at the first choice point. Now he's at the second choice point. Now he's here. Now he's got the food. And he's, he just, you know, he hears it all. So he goes, like, how can that be? The rat's in the antechamber. Uh, he goes over. He takes a look. The rat's asleep. And so mm -hmm. what is actually happening is that during the day, and it, so this is just, a story. This then leads to, this you know, kicks off a hundred other experiments that many different labs have been involved with. And what is quite clear now is that during sleep, 
you essentially replay some of the events of the day. And instead of the memory starting, you know, the input starting in your uh, visual system and then making its way down to your hippocampus, it's your hippocampus rebroadcasting it out back to the rest of your brain. Giving, while you're asleep. While you're asleep, giving your neurons another chance to fire together and hence to wire together. And so it's actually a rehearsal process. So that when you go back into the chamber tomorrow, tomorrow you've it's had another, easier to find the food. Yeah, you've had another go around, you've had another rehearsal. So sleep's really important. And one of the things we don't do well in our society is to sleep. And part of that, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, part of it is because our sleep is controlled by two basic processes. There's a a process that says, I haven't slept in a long time, I'm going to sleep. <laughs> okay, that's, mm -hmm. that's called homeostasis is a long word for it, but that's what we're talking about. And the other part is um, this process by which uh, you have actually a little clock inside a tiny part of your brain called the hypothalamus. And that clock, it's the pacemaker for your entire body. Mm -hmm. It's like you've got 100 billion neurons in here and there's maybe 100,000, 0.01%, oh, 0.01% that are this pacemaker, you take that out, you make a little hole there, and we people have done it, you're completely arrhythmic. You, you know, it doesn't, you, you just, you no longer have any daily rhythms. You're, you're gone, that's dead. Um, mm, and that, that would be horrible. Oh, it, it is horrible. Oh, yes, yeah, no. it's very serious. Um, so you don't want to do that. No. But what that does, so what happens is as you get older, that pacemaker system like a lot of other things in your brain, just doesn't work quite as well as it used to. And so you wind up with disrupted sleep because your pacemaker is not working as well as it should be. You still have that uh, system that says, gee, I'm exhausted, I haven't slept. Uh, but even that's not quite as good as it used to be. So you wind up with messed up sleep. And because you have messed up sleep, your memory's not as good. So that's one of the things, okay? So that's just one thing. Well, what can you do to fix that? Well. You have to ask, okay, how does that pacemaker work and what drives it? Well, uh, there are certain drivers, and the most important one is blue light. There's a specialized population of cells in your retina, in your eye, that, you know, most of them go from the eye eventually to the cortex. No, not these guys. They go right to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, right to that part of the hypothalamus. It's a nonstop path and they're sensitive to blue light, they're sensitive to sunrise and sunset. And it turns out that if you stimulate those cells with a special kind of light box, we actually have one, we've got one in the lab. It's called an iPad or an iPod well, or, you uh, know. No, it would no. be a little better than that, but it's okay, it's not, you can get it for a hundred bucks, you know. Yeah. Uh, if you give it at the right time, the whole thing is to hit the clock mm. at the right point in the cycle and then you jig it to the right place. And we can now actually do that. We can improve people's sleep. So uh, sleep is a big one. What about, so that's one. What, what about stress? Yeah, you know, stress is a bad one. Because you talked one. about it. We live in a high, uh, highly stressed society. We do. We live in a very stressogenic society, and stress is bad for you. Um, why is it bad? Well, a hundred reasons. It suppresses your immune system, uh, and that's bad for your brain at a lot of different levels. Um, um, it turns out that... Um, we didn't really know this until fairly recently, but in contrast to what most people think, you're actually making new brain cells every day. Mm -hmm. It turns out that when you're stressed, um, under conditions of chronic stress, you secrete too much of a, horm a stress hormone called cortisol. Mm -hmm. And cortisol, you know, has its effects, uh, you know, on your uh, immune system, but it also feeds back to your brain and chronic, long-term exposure to cortisol kills neurons. And How does it do that? It, Isn't there the blood-brain barrier? No, the, it just goes know, right through. It really does? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. It goes right through. It has, a, it has privilege. Uh, because oh you, want, you want it to happen on a short-term basis. You know, mm -hmm. if you see that lion uh, in the bush, uh, you will release cortisol and you want to turn off all kinds of stuff in your brain and focus on running away. And so it, you so know, it's actually, there for a, uh, so it's there for a, reason. a survival purpose. It's there for a survival pe purpose. Yeah. But our stressors are no longer lions lurking in the bush. Our stressors are, you know, a, you know, a kid who's on drugs, a marriage that's bad, mm -hmm. a boss that's a bully. Can't who knows make, what it yeah, is? You know, can't make you know, the mortgage payment Can't this make month the mortgage or, payment. Yeah, who yeah. knows what it is? Um, and the effect of chronic stress is then to feed back to the brain and to take 
to, to kill neurons, but the, the old wise and tough neurons, they can take it. Mm -hmm. The new neurons that you just made in the last few weeks, a lot of them are going to die anyway. Because yeah. um, the most important thing for survival um, is whether you can win friends and influence people if you're a new neuron. You know, you can't, you have to, you have to attach yourself to something well, you, else. Well, so, you have yeah. to, you know, you got to pass your business cards out network. to a lot of people. Yeah. You've got to yeah. network. You've got to become a part of the network. So that's one big determinant. But on top of it, cortisol just kills the babies. They're just more vulnerable. As I mentioned, we're basically making new neurons every day, maybe 10,000 a week. So if you want to make more neurons next week, the one single thing you can do is physical exercise. Exercise turns out to be probably the single best thing you can do to keep your cognitive health longer. I mean, what uh, we're telling people now yeah. is that exercise is medicine. How much is the right amount? So what I usually tell people is more. <laughs> okay. More than you're doing now. <laughs> More than you're doing now is the sad truth. But, you know, having said this, uh, you know, just even getting up off, off your butt and, uh, you know, off the couch and walking around the block is going to be helpful. Um, but the amount of exercise that's appropriate for a frail 85-year-old is not going to be the same as the amount of exercise that's appropriate for a robust 60-year-old. Yeah, for a robust 60-year-old like our parents. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. so uh, uh, so I tell people, you know, you should make sure that you that you do probably a little more than you think you want. You're, you're you're probably more than you're doing now. The other thing is not to neglect the different components of exercise. So uh, one of the uh, fascinating studies that was done in this uh, subject was done uh, uh, at our Center for Brain Health at UBC uh, uh, by a lady called Teresa Lou Ambrose. She took a group of 65-year-old uh, women and she put them through different kinds of exercise. And she took one group and told them to, you know, feel good. She took another group and she gave them a lot of cardio. She did another group and did a lot of resistance training, a lot of weights. Mm -hmm. Guess what? the resistance training group actually did better than, than everybody else. Cardio was also very beneficial, for yeah. sure. But, you know, it comes back to the mechanism. There are now studies showing that it looks as though there is a protein that is actually released from stressed muscles. And that protein makes its way through the blood-brain barrier into the brain, where it actually ticks off a cascade of neurogenesis. So stress muscles are okay, stress isn't. Yeah, stress <laughs> muscles are okay. So you want to basically make sure you don't neglect um, at least light weights. And, uh, so it doesn't have to be heavy. It doesn't have to be heavy, but you should, uh, you gotta work. You gotta work. And it's yeah. really, again, it's quite counterintuitive. Uh, what she did was, uh, you know, she studied, you know, uh, uh, this group of 65-year-olds. She found after, uh, you know, eight months of this, their cognition improved. Then she did another group, people who've got what's called mild cognitive impairment, mm -hmm. which are the beginning stages of Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we have some drugs that are, you know, frankly not that effective in uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, and so she had a drug group, uh, a nothing group, and an exercise group. The exercise group did at least as well as the drug group in terms of not getting worse. You touched on Alzheimer's, which is, I think, the biggest fear anybody yeah. over 55 has. Is there anything I can do to prevent that from happening? How do I even know whether or not I might be a potential candidate? I think we know quite a lot about the risks for Alzheimer's now. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you had asked me 10 years ago, what fraction of the risks for Alzheimer's are genetic? I would have said, eh, 5%. There are a couple of genes that we know about and, uh, you know, maybe we'll discover more. Okay, well, in the last 10 years, all that has changed. We now have over 20 different genes that variants in these genes can affect your risk of uh, Alzheimer's. There's one that's very well known. There's a gene called APOE. Mm -hmm. And it comes in uh, three flavors, APOE2, 3, and 4. And it's involved in you know, moving fats around your body and actually your brain uh, in particular. And if you've got the APOE4 variant, that's about 60% of people with Alzheimer's. Have How that do you variant. know whether or not you've got it? Well, you get uh, your genome sequenced. Oh, so which you, we can now do. Which, which you can now do. So you could find out if you've got that variant, because that's certainly, that's one of the biggest, but there's actually 19 more uh, that people are studying. That's just the most famous one and the best studied one. Uh, but um, we but, are but doing that kind of work now where we're trying to predict 
uh, the genetic risks, and mm. then there are the environmental risks. And the environmental risks are, you know, not using your noggin, uh, having like a lot to of think. You mean? Yeah, like, like mm. having a lot of stress. Um, one of the things, you know, so we now know what the well, we don't know for sure what the root problem is in Alzheimer's, but we know one of the manifestations is these plaques that yes. form inside your head. And we know what they're made of, a protein called beta amyloid, and it, they grab each other and they stick, uh, you know, they stick to themselves. And basically so start to clog up the neural pathways. They start to clog up, uh, you know, the brain and they, they're toxic. Mm -hmm. But we know that they are um, promoted, their production and their aggregation is promoted by uh, bad circulation. So if you've got bad circulation because you haven't looked after yourself because you, you haven't done exercise, exercise, you haven't exercised right, yeah. and your diet's bad and etc cetera, etc cetera, that you know increases the risk of having bad circulation in your brain and increases therefore the production of beta amyloid and increases your odds of Alzheimer's. I should remind you, you may not know this, but uh, your brain is only 2% of your body mass. Mm but it is actually more than 20% of your circulation. Yeah. I tell people that the brain is the heart's best customer. It's 20% of your circulation, it's 20% of your oxygen consumption, of your blood sugar. Right. Uh, it's a huge disproportionate energy hog. So if something goes wrong with your uh, cardiovascular system, your brain is going to feel it. And it will one, pay the price. It will pay the price. And in fact, when people are diagnosed with Alzheimer's, there is very frequently a component of what's called vascular dementia. Mm. So when I talk to some of my Alzheimer's uh, physicians, you know, uh, colleagues, they say, well, is there ever really a pure case of Alzheimer's? It could be little strokes in addition to Alzheimer's. It could be, uh, you know, the vasculature is not working so well. So you really, so that's another big environmental risk. On the consumption side, what do we need to cut out? Uh, what's toxic to our brain? Well, uh, basically, you know, I can think of drugs, alcohol, oh, yes. tobacco. You know, I'm, I'm <laughs> so I'm not a fan of most of these. You know, uh, these drugs. I really, you know, I mean, I'm really, you know, so maybe I'm not popular right now, but I don't actually think we should be encouraging people to either smoke marijuana or drink a lot. Yep. You know, there's been this suggestion that uh, you know a glass of wine a day is good for you, and it probably is, but much more than that probably isn't. Yeah. Uh, and there's more and more studies uh, showing uh, that, you know, once you get to two, three, four glasses of wine a day, uh, your, uh, uh, you know, your brain starts to shrink. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I can't see how that could be good. Uh, right. Marijuana tickles, uh, you know, a population of receptors in your brain. It affects your memory over time. Uh, uh, there have been studies showing that, uh, you know, teenagers who smoke marijuana wind up with lower IQs. And, you know, you only have this one brain. It's got to last you your whole life. I think you want to think in terms of a balanced diet, mostly a plant-based diet, complex carbohydrates. What I tell people is eat all the different colors of the rainbow. Mm -hmm. Eat a little less meat, uh, uh, eat a little more fruits and vegetables. Um, and the evidence is that if you do all those things, if you do exercise and sleep and uh, reduce you know, stress, reduce and, stress <laughs> and you put it all together, studies have shown you could you know, reduce the danger, the odds of getting Alzheimer's in the next five years by 50%. Just by doing those Just by things. doing those things. Okay, so you've devoted a, such an enormous part of your career to uh, the establishment of the UBC Brain Research Center and so on. You're not there now. You've moved out into the private sector because, is it because you want to be able to now start to take what you know to people? And, and first answer that question, then we'll talk about what well, you're doing. Well, I'm, I'm still <laughs> a professor at uh, UBC. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've... Uh, you know, I spent the last 17 years as director of the uh, Brain Research Center and then the Javad Moafagian Center for Brain Health, and mm -hmm. it's been a fantastic experience, and we've opened this wonderful new facility with uh, just amazing technologies and people, and it's, it's great. Um, and, you know, uh, once the building opened, uh, I made the decision to step down as director, but I'm still a faculty member at UBC, and I'm still making revolutionary discoveries. Um, but I have um, actually started two companies. One is a biotech company, which is uh, uh, looking to develop uh, you know, new therapies for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and stroke and other things like this. So we're, I'm working hard on that. Um, but 
you know, more relevant to this conversation, uh, I'm the founder and, uh, you know, the co-founder and CEO of a company called Synaptitude, Synaptitude Brain Health, which is really trying to take some of the things we've been talking about and bring it to the public. And the idea is that what we need is, what people need is a much better assessment of their brain health. Mm -hmm. So if I were emperor, uh, I would mandate that every person in Canada or the world, dare I say it, uh, should come into the Center for Brain Health on their, pick a number, 50th birthday. They should have their genome scanned because mm -hmm. we can do it now. Uh, they should have their brain scanned so we can see how it's working. We can see mm. now the pathways inside the brain. We can see the strength of connections inside your head. We can compare you to everybody else. We and, can and so is that accessible? I think about that and I go, but where could I go to get that done? In the best of all worlds, the medical system would pay for it. Mm -hmm. So call me when that actually happens. That's what Synaptitude will actually do for you. Mm -hmm. It will bring together a full, full scale assessment of your cognitive function, reaction time, memory, attention, uh, all, all these different aspects of your cognition uh, with a full-on brain scan where you basically look at the strength of the connections among all your different cortical areas. Uh, you look at the volume of your hippocampus, which is a measure of how many neurons you've got and how many neurons you're making. Um, and then um, we'll also scan your genome to see whether you've got that APOE4 variant along with the other 19 genes that could be predisposing you to Alzheimer's. And basically tell you where you stand relative to everybody else your age. Mm -hmm. And then based on an understanding of um, who you are, who, who your brain is, um, we will enter you into the Synaptitude Brain Fitness Program, which will optimize your sleep, optimize your diet, optimize your exercise program, give you all these things. Think of it as Weight Watchers for your brain. Mm -hmm. And on top of it, it will be bespoke in the sense it will be customized to your genome and it will be customized to your connectome, to the wires inside your head. We're developing games now, exercises, that will activate particular pathways inside your head. We have the chance now to actually improve people's brain health. Are your doors open yet? Uh, we're not quite ready for customers yet, but uh, the website is there. You can read a little yeah. more about it at synaptitudebrainhealth.com. Just uh, take a look and uh, you know, you'll get a chance to see what's going on and uh, perhaps uh, join the program and participate. Wish you all the luck. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Stuart. Appreciate you doing this. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure.